The authors of today's ambitious plan to devise a global blueprint for the future of agriculture say, look around you. Everything that caused today's food crisis can only get worse. We'll have around 9 billion mouths to feed by 2050. And we've got to do that without destroying the very resources we depend on. Some say this report has landed at just the right time and from the best man to do it. Former chief scientist at the World Bank and now at DEFRA, Professor Bob Watson also chaired the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change until the Bush administration decided it didn't like what he was saying. Now his big mission is to sort out farming and he wants a wholesale rethink. Agriculture is complex. It's not just production. It's how do we make it sustainable from a social perspective, taking into account gender issues and other social issues. It's an environmental issue. How do we produce food without creating problems for biodiversity, land degradation, water degradation, and of course causing climate change. Uh, so it's a key issue. And if we only look at one part of the agricultural system, we will not succeed. So we have to place agriculture within the context of the economic framework, social framework, and environment mental framework. So how do those from the two polar extremes of the food debate see the future? In simple terms, those from the scientific or mainstream view of agriculture and those who favour the more traditional organic approach. People come from all over the world to look at this field. It's a classical plant breeding experiment, a patchwork of plots, each treated with different types and amounts of fertilizers. It was this post-war approach that laid the foundations of the first green revolution, the last time scientists stepped up production and came to the rescue of a hungry world. This archive of jars and bottles is the data from that famous fieldwork, 160 years worth of soil and crops, which scientists here say is proof that it is possible to treat the same plot of land over and over again with chemical fertilizers and steadily increase yields. That's the philosophical heart of the Green Revolution. Is what you're saying that essentially we need a second Green Revolution? Nothing should be off limits. We should be able to use all of the power of genetics, plant breeding, uh, chemistry, and of course uh, advanced engineering technologies, and these days aided significantly by uh, mathematical approaches to modeling systems and advanced computational technique. So really, this is the challenge of the future, I think, to bring all of these things to bear on what is uh, undoubtedly uh, the balance between let's call it natural ecosystems and the, the productivity that we know we need to feed 9 billion people in the coming period. But today's report says increased productivity has already come at a cost, putting pressure on people and the land they live on. Rising oil prices, climate change, scarce water and land are all set to make that worse. The authors acknowledge that emerging technologies such as GM crops may well have a role to play, though the report's unmistakably anti-big business tone seems to have been behind a walkout earlier this year by the biotech companies. It's a tension that's run right through this five-year process. Many scientists tend to be receptive to GM technologies and dismissive of organic farming as too small scale to be relevant. This is part of a network of organic farms delivering boxes of vegetables to 50,000 families a week across the UK. It's a business with an annual turnover of around £35 million. It's still relatively small scale, but organic farmers say they could feed a growing world population if given the chance. They also say theirs is the only truly sustainable approach to agriculture because they use less oil-based energy, so minimise greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these will go well over a foot deep. And they start to basically bring air back into the soil so it can start to sustain life. Rob Haywood from Riverford Organics says organic farming based on creating and keeping soils fertile without adding chemicals is the obvious choice for the developing world. We're in an incredible situation with organic farming across the world. I mean, there are 51 million hectares of organically managed land, 700,000 organic farms. There's organic farmers all over the world that are saying, this works in practice. If I was them, I would be questioning whether I would want to go down a route of being dependent on expensive agrochemical products from Western agrochemical companies. When we've shown that it's a farming system that works, and it's something that, that the public and communities want.
With 800 million people, just over 10% of the world's population, malnourished, the report wants governments to spend more public money on science and technology research in developing countries, where private sector investment is almost non-existent. To focus more on stressed land, like our global fisheries, dry lands and mountain and coastal ecosystems. And to shift the focus from production technologies to making food in ways which don't make climate change worse. Critics, even those already focused on the needs of the developing world, say they've heard all of this before and that with plenty of people already trying to sort these issues out, there was really no need for this report at all. I have a problem in that there's no real solid take-home message from the report that's really going to make governments sit up and think, hey, we haven't thought about this before, we really need to do something about it. It has many sort of secondary-level messages, many of which we would go along with, many of which are quite familiar. I think the report would have had more impact if it had come out and said, we have to do this, we must stop doing that. I can't see that in the report as it stands. This is that a significant and already Bob Watson seems to be having some of the problems he had with climate change. Sixty countries have signed off on his report, but the US, Canada and Australia haven't. America wanted less on the downsides of free trade and more positive noises on GM crops. Even his home team, the British government, has yet to sign up. And with the biotech companies and the big food producers absent from this debate, it's an open question what impact this report will have in the real world.